Hey there, folks. Welcome to episode 13. Lucky number 13. Hope you're having a wonderful positive Friday. Of course, uh, each and every episode is brought to you by John Deere. I had the privilege of uh, having Ben uh, from the uh, Harvest Profit team. Of course, Harvest Profit uh, is uh, uh, owned by John Deere. And uh, Ben did a little demo for us in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. I was in that meeting and uh, got to see some of the inside uh, details of the Harvest Profit Planner. It's been a great tool for our farm to use here for the 2024 crop. And uh, I strongly encourage you to check it out at harvestprofit.com. Uh, I also want to give out a, a quick uh, congrats uh, to Egg Eye 3. Uh, they are uh, on board as a sponsor. We had John on last week, uh, but they surpassed 1.3 million acres. I just saw it come across X of uh, farms or land uh, onboarded in their platform. Again, uh, production insurance. If you want to learn more about Egg Eye 3, uh, the link will be uh, in the uh, podcast notes here. So you can click that, uh, but you can also check them out at uh, eggi3.ai that is their website uh, they can get a hold of you and you can also reach out to, to the show and we'll, we'll get you in contact uh, all right um, i had uh, chuck penner join me this week we had a great conversation covering multiple topics so hang in for that one um, of course we're going to get to eating our veggies we got lots of work to do there i'll do my best with a market update uh, of course um, we we give away a bag of canola seed uh, every single month. So we're going to talk about that towards the end. We have a winner here for the month of January. Uh, Nashville is what you would text in. one 855 That is the uh, the text line here at the What the Futures podcast. Again, save it to your phone. I, I'm going to do a lot of communicating via text uh, throughout the busy growing season. Uh, we are going to have a new word for the month of February, but we're just going to sit tight here for uh, one week. And uh, I hope to get um, Marlon Travel. Uh, my mom's a, a, has been a travel agent for I don't know how long now, a uh, very long time. I'm thinking uh, must be about 20 years. Um, but uh, she's over at Marlin Travel. They're going to hook us up with this trip uh, or the, the hook us up with how to get uh, to Nashville. They're, they're not providing the trip per se, but they are the experts when it comes to planning the trip. And so we'll see if we can get her on here in February to just talk about what there is to do in Nashville and what is fun about traveling over to Tennessee. Uh, all right. Um, my positive moment for the week, I, I went out and did some public speaking this week. I've done a couple presentations lately. Um, I, uh, I've done a couple presentations lately. I am some of them virtual, uh, which is fine, but getting in front of a, a group of growers is always a good time. Uh, so I did some public speaking. I, I got in front of a, a group of growers, uh, a great crowd there out in Fort Saskatchewan, and uh, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. If you if you're looking for a speaker for uh, one of your events, um, let me know. Uh, I got a few different topics I can cover, and I certainly have a lot of fun doing it as well. So I actually have a few people reaching out, which is nice um, on the public speaking side. So that's my positive moment. Um, let's see here. Let's go before we get into more of a market update. Uh, what what we'll do here is uh, I want to talk canola for a sec, then we'll get to eating our veggies, and then we'll talk about markets after that, because eating our veggies, there's some important stuff there. But I just, I want to just throw out the warning sign, like flashing lights, uh, loud noises, sounds, whatever it takes to get your attention. Uh, but canola made a new low on the March futures. And I get it. I get it. There's... I called you guys fearless last week with basis contracts or unpriced canola. Um, it, it's a, a tough time of, of marketing that I find the darkest times are a couple of months behind us already. But when there's lack of uh, South American weather scare or lack of a rally, um, this can be a tough time to market as well. But a lot of farms need to generate cash flow right now. Uh, January, February, March, April, so on and so forth. The, the bills are due. Interest is expensive when your line of uh, credit or your crop input loan is at 9, 10, 11, 13 uh, percent. It adds up in a hurry, folks. And uh, so anyways, canola. 
closing at what was it 601 or something like that right above 600 i know that you pick up a article in a few of our publications across uh, the prairies you're gonna see people talk about canola going to 500 okay it's kind of um I don't want to say it's an easy thing, but we've been in a downtrend or an easy call to say canola is going to 500. Um, you know, who really knows? But we're, we have been in a downtrend. We are in a downtrend. And if we break below 600 from a, um, emotional point of view, maybe, a um, psychological point of view, you know, what's going to hold it up here? Um, if we get below 600, if we close at 599 in the next couple of days, what are we looking at to get it back over 600? And I'm no genius. I'm no expert. Um, seek the advice. But if we, if we break below 600, then all eyes are pointed towards, well, now we have a five handle, right? We have a five, okay? And everyone's just going to stare down the 500, just stare at it and say, all right, that's probably where we're headed. Uh, that's where people are on record of saying that's where it's going. Again, I don't think anybody really, really knows, but it's a downtrend. And if we break below 600, that was viewed as a level of some type of support. Again, maybe psychological. But it wouldn't surprise me to see this trade to 580 in short order, 550 in short order, and then, heck, are we going to see 500? It wouldn't surprise me over the next four to six weeks. Now you're going to listen to this and say, Ryan, you are insane. Look out your window. It is dry. The forecast, long-range forecast, maybe not friendly, but... Um, again, who can predict the weather a week out? Number one, number two, some of the long range forecasts that I've been privy to show precipitation events in the spring. They show moisture events in the spring, also showing moisture events in the fall and maybe a bit of a dry summer. Okay. Um, I, again, who knows, but if we go, let's say, for example, you know, hear me out. Uh, if we go below 600 and we, we're trading in this 500 range in a downward trend, we keep leaking lower. We have the expectation that carryover is going to climb year over year of canola. Now, is it going to be 2 million ton, 3 million ton, 6 million ton as I roll my eyes a little bit? Time will tell. Um, I'm not in the six camp, as you can uh, see. Uh, but it's not bullish because it's not getting smaller, okay? Now, if we plant less acres into dry conditions, sure, we're off to the races. But everybody, if we're in a downtrend, continuing in a downtrend, what's going to happen over the next four weeks? we got to find a bullish story. We need to find something out there to rally we need an argentina brazil something or another we need some purchases we i was chatting with a, a grain buyer in melford saskatchewan some would call it god's country melford saskatchewan you know in his client base that he talks to a, a huge amount of canola on farm no real concerns out there and people are bullish because of weather i i, I get it folks i i get it but i'm I'm scared for you a little bit. I am. Um, and the spring can bring all sorts of scenarios and all sorts of things can happen in the spring. But the cool thing about this is you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. So you can actually, you know, lock in some canola again, seek the advice of a professional, but they can show you strategies to participate in upside later on in the summer. So you don't have to let it go down at 12 bucks before you start to participate. Or like, have you guys done the math on a, another $100 a ton drop? I don't want to do it. I don't want to say the numbers out loud. It's not fun. It's scary. Okay. But canola is heading in that type of direction. And if we close below 600 this week, 
on Positive Friday. I hope not. Sure, certainly wrecks my Positive Friday vibes. But uh, yeah, just I don't know, folks. Um, the trend is your friend. The trend is lower. And uh, fingers crossed that perks up in the spring here. But we we might have a heck of a six weeks ahead of us yet. So buckle up. Uh, all right. Um, oh, last thing on. No, I'll talk about that later. Never mind. Okay, let's eat our veggies now. Because why do we do it? Because it's the right thing to do. Okay. So I've got uh, some homework for you. Again, um, seek the advice of a professional at all times. These are just things that I find interesting. And um, who knows? Might be terrible calls. Might be good calls. You know, time will tell. Uh, okay. So we had James on last week, Crop Management Network. Uh, obviously, uh, just fantastic to have him on. And uh, we have to have him back soon because that episode has just whew, just took off. He's a popular fella. And uh, anyways, that's a popular episode here uh, when you look at uh, at the catalog. But make sure you got that 2024 crop or crop, geez, fertilizer locked up. Um, I I'm probably just need another sip of this real quick. All right, there we go. Back on the rails. Um, the fertilizer, get that locked up for 2024 if you haven't already. Not th not for 2025, though. Stay patient. He talked about that correction. Second thing for eating your veggies, take a look at fuel prices. I, I mentioned it lightly, maybe last week, the week before. Take a look at fuel. I got a, a dollar three, a dollar five, summer diesel, hauled in, delivered now, paid later on in, in May, something like that. A dollar three. It was a dollar a little while back. Now I'm seeing a dollar three. I just wonder with the tension in the Middle East, you know, as my phone beeps and I, I see an update that uh, we're, we're, uh, that the US is going to go and attack, uh, you know, somebody here, the Middle East tensions are, are picking up. And uh, with that, again, I just wonder if the price of fuel climbs. And I also look at recession, and I know a lot of families are struggling out there. But I just wonder uh, if uh, if we don't see interest rates drop in here, you know, here in March or even in the spring, maybe it's a bit longer. And I just wonder if fuel prices creep up a little bit higher. So if you can like um, buy, I'd call it like a, a tranche or a percentage, not at all your fuel needs, I'd certainly take a look at that. Again, I'm not a fuel expert. If you know of a fuel expert, though, please get us in touch with each other. All right. Um, we again continue to eat our veggies here number three we want to sell old crop red lentils and again incremental sale listen to chuck later on in the episode here he's coming up next um listen to chuck he'll explain it in great detail but you want to take a look at those red lentils and consider some an incremental sale here on old crop and even maybe uh tickle in a new crop sale there too and then, of course, uh, I'm going to say number four here is price those green crops. And you're going to say, Ryan, what are you talking about? We made new highs in old crop and new crop green peas. And yes, you did. Old crop greens trading as high as 1950. And new crop green peas trading as high as $15. I heard maybe even closer to 16 But I was not privy to the conversation. I overheard the conversation. Uh, but Hey, it's up to you now to make the phone call and see what's out there. I know 15 is splashed with act of God across many uh, different locations. It's up to you to see if there's a 16 out there or if I'm just blowing smoke, uh, lentils again, uh, Chuck's going to talk about it in great detail, but we'd like to get some new crop green lentils and old crop green lentils priced here as well. Um, okay. So that's one, two, three, four fuel. Fertilizer fuel, old crop lentils, uh, and then we're talking about the green crops, green lentils, green peas. I think we're going to leave it at that for now uh, when it comes to eating our veggies. If you have anything else you'd like to add to that, hit us up across our social media platforms. Okay, I'll talk markets, then we're going to turn it over to Chuck, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, by just uh, announcing who won our bag of P516L from the great folks over at Pioneer Seed. Okay, folks, uh, markets. I I don't have a lot of stories, actually, for this week. I, I still wanted to bring out those 
you know, top two or three stories, but I know that you guys are all tuned in and you you know them before I do. So I don't know what the point is. Anyways, uh, Canola, new low on the March contract, 601.20 as of recording. Bean oil, new low as well. All right, 45.60. Uh, soybeans 1203 they're up they're actually 40 cents above the low there um, and meal has rebounded as well um, but again folks um, just circle back to canola nov canola is trading at 612 that guy was as high as 770 at, at one point i'm not saying to go gangbusters here but i would say if i had to take an angle and a guess this price is going to 550 on new crop canola before it gets to 650. Again, when will we see 650? What will that look like? I guess we'll find out in the spring, but it's tough going. What I don't like out of um, China, uh, and China is buying Canadian canola, by the way. Um, They are. It's actually the other countries that are not buying Canadian canola. The the Viterra uh, gentleman I spoke with uh, off the record uh, I guess I shouldn't have said the Viter gentleman then, but uh, forgive me uh, for that. Um, you know, he just mentioned it was the other countries that were not buying uh, canola from Canada. So China's definitely uh, hanging in there. And I think I talked about that a few weeks back. Um, all right. Um, we got spring wheat, uh, 696. We did hit a high of 710 on the March contract. Basis levels hanging in there, uh, doing very, very well. Exports up actually kind of fun to price wheat compared to some of the other crops right now like barley Uh, but we did hit that 20-day moving average and then pulled back so i'm not bullish spring wheat by any means i just am very thankful that we are exporting as much as we are and that carryover stocks uh, are going to be tight and even world supply i believe chuck in his presentation today um that i was at mentioned tight to world supply on Maybe it was high protein wheat. I shouldn't put words in his mouth, but anyways, um, yeah. Uh, Casey wheat down a penny uh, and a bit here at six fourteen. What I'll say about uh, Kansas City wheat is there is a very good winter wheat crop coming in the U.S. Much better than the past couple of years. So if you're a CPS grower, pay attention because you may see the bottom fall out of this market uh, as we get into the growing season. There, get that crop out of. Uh, out of dormancy okay um corn corn futures i was going to take a peek here at corn and i forgot to um obviously barley values continuing to be pressured corn down a penny at 447 on the march contract um basically trading sideways all all right some of our specialty crops yellow peas uh, china is backing away from the market chuck's going to talk about that uh, so yellow pea prices backing off. Now, again, will India stay in and, and buy? Uh, something we're going to have to keep an eye on. Uh, that'll help support prices. But with China backing away, if India backs away, then for some reason uh, the situation is not great and we see a, a pretty big pullback. Green peas we already talked about, but again, 15 for new crop green peas. Secure the bag, folks. You know, get that uh, contract written up and... Uh, Uh, Make yourself some money here in 2024. That's new crop, of course. Feed barley down 50 cents a bushel from just a few weeks ago. It's actually like 48 cents. It was down about 15 bucks a ton. Um, Feed barley, feed anything's not really going in the right direction for us. So, um, yeah, that's what I have for markets uh, for for today. Okay, let's uh, turn it over to Chuck Penner. Chuck's got some great uh, info for us. Uh, So uh, here we go, Chuck. Joining me once again from Leftfield Commodity Research is Chuck Penner. How's your day going, Chuck? What are you up to? Well, it's, uh, what is it, plus seven or eight or something like that here and sunny. So if you like that sort of thing, it's a great day. (laughs) 100%. Not everybody does. Everybody, a lot of people would like to see a bunch of snow and uh, that kind of thing right about now. Well, yeah, like... uh... We like I don't know it was like plus eleven yesterday or something like that something crazy but we actually got a little bit of tobogganing done here the other day and we started to build a snowman but he is no longer with us um, and I, I chatted with a couple of farmers and they're like yeah I got the sled fired up for for the Sunday for like an hour and that's the extent of snowmobiling so yeah yeah uh, it's been a bit a minute since we've had you on the show I think it was before Christmas so what have you been up to in the month of January. 
Well, January has been uh, pretty good. I spent uh, one week at the uh, crop production show in, in Saskatoon and uh, spoke at a few meetings there. And then last week I was actually in the northern U.S. Uh, in Minot. Mm -hmm. And then I was supposed to get out to Idaho and travel. Things kind of got in the way. So I had to do a virtual one, uh, virtual meeting for Idaho. Uh, okay. And then now in this week, next week, I'm in Weyburn on Tuesday. Uh, and then the week after, I'm in Yorkton and Humboldt. Uh, so, um, and then after that, I'm going on vacation. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Well, I guess you had to book a vacation because your vacation in Idaho got canceled or postponed. So yes. I see how that works. Yeah. Can I tell people now that you have, you've added potatoes to the crops that you cover? Is that what you were doing in Idaho or, or going to present on? No. Okay. It's Darn funny. It. Uh, when I was, uh, so I was talking, talking to the Pacific North or uh, Pacific Northwest Canola Association. So there's more canola being grown out there, winter and spring canola, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. And um, it's funny uh, when in uh, November I was in Montana and sitting in a little workshop thing with the canola group. And then they asked the question, uh, so does anyone here grow canola or who here grows canola? And I'm kind of, what? Like that people ask that question. Well, down there they ask that question, right? So yep. a couple of people put up their hand and, and that kind of thing, but it was still very much treated like a specialty crop. So, yep. so, you know, somebody who can talk about canola and I talked about pulse crops as well too. Um, that's a bit of a novelty down there. So. Uh, yeah. yeah i'm the token token canola guy i guess so did you did you pick up on any little tidbits we had uh david from marketplace was was just on last week talking about you know malt barley or rejected malt barley and corn coming up from the u.s like anything else that you picked up on while you were there is anything interesting well they're gonna grow a lot of green lentils um okay they're they're gonna grow more chickpeas they're gonna go more green peas um so uh, you know, same kind of thing as what's happening north of the border. Yeah. Uh, so, so same type of thing there, but that's one of the ones where one of those crops where, um, you know, heads up, uh, we're, you know, with decent weather, we're going to see some, some pretty big crops probably this next year. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So we got a growing season ahead of us at some point this year, but there's been all this talk about um, farmers, uh, you know, being, sold or how sold are they and i've seen farmers you know reported that farmers are only 20 percent sold and so on and so forth um in your travels conversations research do you have any numbers you'd like to debate or throw out there when it comes to percent sold for farms well it's kind of interesting I, because i've heard some of those same kind of discussions and so i started to use the numbers that we use in our research are come from the cgc the grain commission mm -hmm. and so they report on farmer deliveries and i know that's not the same as being sold you know the you know most of it is a bunch of it is sold prior to that and that kind of thing but it's the next best measure that we have and it really varies by crop uh, so one of the charts, I put it on Twitter or on X, uh, and um, one of the charts was for peas, for example. And, and mm -hmm. when we got this flush of business from India, we went from being undersold or underdelivered uh, to being way more heavily sold than or delivered than, than we normally are at this time of year. So the chart just kind of went like this. Um, and so um, that's, that's one where we are oversold. Uh, where, where farmers are yeah. oversold would be something like peas. Uh, canola has been one of the ones probably that's been, that's had the most attention. And yeah, the, the deliveries are trailing last year. Uh, so deliveries include two crushers uh, and to elevators. So deliveries are behind last year. That's not really a surprise to anybody. Um, Durham is trailing as well too. Mm -hmm. uh, spring wheat is a little bit above normal deliveries at this time of year so Makes it sense. really really varies by crop but then when i'm talking to people in the in you know out in the, out in the country and and people who advise farmers and all of those kind of things uh they're saying that that farmers for most of these crops aren't concerned about being undersold yet um, mm -hmm. and the reason is is the dryness uh, is that they're yeah. they're kind of leaning toward uh you know if i have a choice here i would rather be undersold than then have too much out of the bin and then if we if we run into another short crop then i don't have something next year or if we have a short crop and prices go up then 
you know, I'm going to be left out in the cold on that as well too. So if, even if they are, are behind on, let's say on canola or, or that kind of thing, uh, it's not really a, a worry at this point and, and, and maybe mm-hmm. even a preference, uh, put it that way. Okay. Yeah. That, those are interesting comments for sure. I, I chat, uh, oh, I, I did a little bit of travel. I actually, uh, I was in Manitoba a couple of weeks ago hey, I saw that. and, um, so I, you know, I've chatted with a few growers and, and, you know, the Rolodex, there's quite a few farmers that reach out, uh, from time to time. So, um, I'm not, unless you need to generate cash flow now, I'm not seeing that much concern out there. And I, I was, you know, I threw it out last week that everyone was bullish and it still feels like everybody is bullish, which again, we can, uh, debate that till the cows come home. But, um, I, you know, I look at it, there's crops in my opinion that, you know, a lot of farms grow a variety of crops, you know, maybe it's three or four or five or whatever, but in that mix, there's a few crops that you're heavily sold on. And then there's one crop that you're maybe a bit light on. It seems to be canola, but if it's a pulse, those are heavily sold. I think a lot of malt got sold. I think wheat climbs every single day because there's incentive to move wheat. So I don't, it's my opinion is not 20%. I think farmers are well, um, north of that but um anyways it just feeds into that fear out mm-hmm. there and i don't that's what i don't like i want to dispel that fear so yeah. yeah like when you look at the canola numbers i think it's the deliveries are somewhere around 40 percent of their on-farm supplies yeah so yeah. so no i you know yeah there will be individual farmers that haven't sold much but yeah. uh i i don't think for any crops that that we're even close to 20%. Uh, yeah. And so we're like, technically we're half end of January is halfway through the marketing year. Yeah. So if you were to spread out your sales throughout the year, you'd be at 50% sold. So uh, I think peas right now, like I said, are way above, I think it's like 65%. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we never get to a hundred percent because there's stuff that gets delivered elsewhere or, or fed dogs or, you know, whatever, those kind of things. Right. Yeah. Um, but so we don't ever get to a hundred percent on any crop and there's always carryover and, and all that. Right. So, so the fact that we're at, let's say 40% sold on some of these, it's not that, it's not that much of a concern that the difference is still um, pretty small and uh, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, I got some hard hitting questions for you here coming up. Hey, right, fire away. Well, Let's talk about the lentil market a little bit. Uh, it's actually not that hard of a question because it's so general. But what's going on in the lentil market? What can you update us on? Yeah, you know, there's a few crops where um, I was a lot more optimistic early in the year. Uh, and now I'm starting to get a little more nervous. Okay. Uh, and and not green lentils. Trust me, green lentils have outperformed the, even where where I thought they would go and, and so on. And that's a good that's a good problem to have, I suppose. But uh, so the green lentil side of the market, no, that's strong. And, and that's going to stay strong until we get closer to having a, a 24 crop. Sure. But, um, but on the red lentil side, uh, there's kind of some worrying signals in that market. And so one of them would be uh, when I, when, again, when we look at these grain commission deliveries um, and movement out of country elevators to let's say the west coast for export those have really dropped off and so that pace of exports has really gotten very quiet in the last i'm gonna say four to six weeks um, okay and so that tells me that there's there's not a bunch of sales that they're trying to uh, reach or to meet in ships in vancouver type of thing so that flow of of lentils that this and the grain commission largely reports on red lentils there's really not much green lentils that so it's almost all a red lentil picture so that to me is worrying that the pace is has slowed down now it could always pop up a little bit and as we get later into the year but we also have the australian crop is now fully available uh, yeah. and probably larger than what they report because just like in Canada with canola numbers and stats can uh, in in Australia they they frequently or regularly underreport pulse production so okay. uh, so that's uh, it's probably larger and then of course there's the situation in India and uh, so their planting season of their rabi crop is is kind of wrapped up now and they're actually uh, they could start harvesting the early planted stuff at the end of late February. 
Um, and so what we have there is their, their planting reports that come in weekly uh, mm -hmm. show that red lentil acreage is about 5% more than last year. And okay. last year was a record. Oh. Um, so it's yeah. more than the record. Um, and, and I think it's like 14% above the five-year average. Um, and then when we look at weather, it's pretty, I'm trying to think of the best word to describe it, pretty benign, which in India is good at this time of yep. year. So yep. temperatures are moderate. They're not having screaming uh, heat waves or things like that. And it's the dry season, but, uh, and so the, the rain amounts aren't much, but but sure. they're keeping up with average or, or generally keeping up with normal. Uh, so there are people talking about that India could produce a record lentil crop and that's almost all reds. Uh, so um, if that is being harvested in, you know, starting late February and into March, uh, that's, you know, that could start to also spell uh, reduced demand from India and in the red lentil market this year, uh, India has been the, the big, big buyer. Turkey okay. has bought less. Uh, Bangladesh has bought less. Uh, you know, some of these other countries have bought less. Um, so India has really been driving that. So, so there is some there is some risk in that market. So I okay. know the prices are uh, not where you know anybody really wants them to be, but uh, prices in in places like India, in Pakistan, and so on. Uh, they're not showing any strength there. I, there's no signals that the market is is moving higher. So that one makes me kind of nervous. Um, and then Fair on enough. the green rental side, the amount of production that we could have in Canada and the U.S. this year makes me nervous for the new crop market. Yeah, yeah, fair. Um, would, would the dryness that's lingering around, do you think that could lend a little more support to lentils in the short term or with a new crop coming off? That just might be a little too much to. Yeah, that could actually go either way, uh, yeah. because uh, if we're going into the spring dry and people are worried about planting canola, let's say into the dry ground, you know, geez, what am I going to put? Well, maybe I'll put a pulse in and, and cross my fingers and hope I don't have root rot or yep. that. So it it could actually um, it could actually be negative. We could get a few more pulse acres this summer if it stays dry. Uh, okay. So yeah. So that that to me is it could go if it gets really bad. Well, then, then yeah, which we you know of course you don't want at all. If mm -hmm. it gets really bad, well then yeah yes, but then you also don't have any lentils to sell. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I, I know what the dry conditions. Um, growers I, that I have been chatting with are, are talking about trying to grow crops that are maybe less uh, cash intense or a little, you know, quote unquote, cheaper to grow. So that might fall yeah. in there as well. So, okay. Um, continuing on with India, uh, any updates on uh, the tariff there? The yellow pea market spiked uh, with India uh, removing temporarily uh, the tariff. Anything new? Yeah, that one is that one is really going to be um, a tipping point, and one and one of the reasons is is because we're starting to see signs that Chinese demand for peas might be backing off, which mm -hmm. makes it even more important that we have India as a buyer. So, so to me, that one is one that's um, uh, kind of uh, really, really important uh, for the yellow pea side of the market, and so um, my. If I had to place odds on it right now, I would be around 50-50. Uh, okay. And there's a few few reasons for that, uh, which, which which really doesn't help, I guess, if you're well, flip a <laughs> coin or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, but um, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that when they announced the zero tariff, yellow pea prices in India just crashed. And But the Desi chickpeas, which are kind of the substitute, uh, they dropped, but not that much, and they're starting to head higher. Uh, one of the reasons is is because those acres are less than average this year and that in that in this rabi planting season so okay. they're probably going to have fewer chickpeas than than usual which should help some yellow pea demand as a substitute for that uh, I, I hope I'm, I hope that's uh, I'm explaining that clearly um, so that's that's one of the reasons the other is is that for a number of other pulse crops that we that we really don't care about things like mung beans and, mm -hmm. and pigeon peas and, and those kind of things. Uh, those India has also announced extensions to uh, the zero tariff imports. 
and so they're they're really it, it's to me it sends a signal that Indian government is really concerned about pulse supplies and food prices in general. So yep. that could help um, provide a a little more rationale for yeah they might keep those yellow P um, tariffs at zero. Their their election is uh, approaching in April May. So if we see food prices and especially desi chickpeas, that's the one that I'm watching even more carefully than the yellow pea price. But if that continues to sort of keep rising a little bit as you get closer to that election, uh, then that that increases the odds that they keep the yellow pea tariff at zero beyond March 31st. Okay. Uh, I mean, but the problem is, is that by then you have, um, you know, you'll have wanted to make a lot of your rotation and seating decisions here yeah. so you know we're it's going to be really tight in terms of how um how that could affect the market and and so on if they do extend it it probably would be for a full year because that's what they've done for other other uh, pulses as well too is say you know we'll flip it forward for a whole nother year at uh, zero and uh, do it that way that would be uh that'd be interesting if we saw that that would yeah. be very interesting so we'll keep it at 50 50 for now as you said yeah. right yeah, sure. perfect. Uh, all right, and uh, one more for you. So I was on X this morning. I put a uh, little, uh, I don't even know what you call it, a tweet is what I want to call it, but uh, just a call out there for some hard-hitting questions for you. And here's one from Tyler. Uh, where's Tyler Farm again? Does it say in here? Southwest Saskatchewan. All right, Southwest Saskatchewan. Well, that's pretty specific, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, he asks, if we see an average crop in Western Canada in 2024, is there any crop that shouldn't be heavily pre-sold? Okay, well, I'm just going to have to untie the question a little bit so so I can yeah. get it straight in my in my uh, my uh, dotage and uh, yeah, um, so so I guess what I'm trying to is is if we have an average crop, uh, are yep. we going to be too heavy? Like, are we are we going to see the it, the markets really uh, drop? And so therefore, trying to get ahead of that with yep. pre selling. I guess that's I guess that's what the question is. Um, so uh, if I run through some of the crops, um, there are some that um, almost regardless, I would say you want to be heavily pre sold. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I run through those, um, and again, we, I talked about those earlier in the, in the podcast, was things like green peas, green lentils, um, and maybe, uh, maybe chickpeas as well, too, is to be, is to be sold on those. Uh, and so those are, yeah, those are the, the situation. In our S&Ds right now, we are using average yields. We, call, yeah. we use what we call the Olympic average. Because you've had such variability the last few years, so you take the last five years, you drop the low and the high, and then the average of the remaining three years, uh, sure. for for better or for worse, whatever it is. Because nobody really knows. Everybody's nervous about the yeah. dryness. Uh, I hear about people who are already penciling in below average yields in their in their uh, their own uh, uh, product uh, cost of production uh, stuff and and things mm -hmm. like that because. Well, they've been smoked uh, two or three years already in a row, so they're they're, they're kind of bracing for the worst. Um, yeah. If we have average yields, um, I guess what I would the ones where it has the potential to to go from uh, low supplies to heavy would be um, we're we're looking at a at a bounce in oat acreage. That's one mm -hmm. that could that could be a little bit that way, but, but even so, like we have a, I think we have a 10% increase in acres uh, penciled in. And then again, with average yields, it doesn't make supplies really heavy, but heavier than they are right now uh, yeah. or, or that, or the way it's feeling right now. And, and uh, um, I think Durham could get heavy uh, as we get into next year. And partly too, because of the, these guys in Turkey that are, that are growing more and uh, um, and so on. So so those are some that would be one that I would be a little bit nervous about. If we get average Durham yields, then we're we're having a uh, a good size crop competing with a good size crop from Turkey. Sure. Um, and so that would be that would be one where I would be a little bit nervous. Uh, spring wheat, not so much. Um, uh, I was actually on a call earlier th or this morning um, with a, a group from Kazakhstan, and uh, this this farm 
has uh, covers three hundred and twenty thousand hectares. <laughs> yeah, just a just a small farm. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was on a call with these guys. So I was asking yeah. them a little bit about what well, what are Kazakh farmers planning on doing. He said probably reducing cereals and going more into oil seeds. Okay. So for them, oil seeds would be sunflowers, um, yeah. some canola as well. But yeah. sunflowers, flax, uh, those kind of things, uh, that's where that's where they're thinking. And they have, he said, they have good snow cover there right now. Okay. So, yeah. uh, so, but, but, but I'm talking to these people and going, like, I just can't wrap my head around the scale of that operation. Like, that's 750,000 acres. That's where you should vacation, Chuck. That's where you should go I'd vacation. love to see it. I'd be fascinated yeah. to see it. Uh, It'd be awesome. Anyway. So, eh, so, but that's, that's kind of an aside. Um in, in terms of other ones, on the canola market, uh, if we have average yields, the one thing that I'm I'm trying to get my head wrapped around, and if your listeners have any insight on this, I'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. But this in, in 24, 25, we're going to have at least one of these crush plants, uh, new crush plants or crush plant expansions come online. Mm -hmm. We might have two of them come online at some point in that marketing year. So our domestic demand then is going to be going up. So the, the, the domestic crush is going to go up. Um, we'll have to see how exports, you know, exports recover and all of those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but we're penciling in a small uh, reduction in canola acres. And mm -hmm. if it stays really dry, that we might lose even more. And so then even if you have average yields, we're not going to have a massive canola crop. Uh, so So that's one that I wouldn't be as worried about selling um barley is he, that's kind of just a uh, just i don't know a bit of a lost cause there it, it's just really yeah. hard to say we were talking about being uh heavily like oversold or undersold earlier i think barley is one where there were where guys are undersold they just they just having a hard time pulling that trigger and uh, uh and letting go slides yeah. every seems to slide every week like it's yeah, yeah it's tough yeah um uh, so uh, yeah barley is really hard to say um yeah on lentils uh, oh these kazakh farmers were also saying probably more pulses as well too so just okay. a heads up um uh, about that um so yeah i'm just trying to think what else might be might be in danger of being heavy supplies i think mustard is going to stay heavy uh even if we have below average yields or, well, right. if we have average yields, I think we're going to have another year of heavy supplies in mustard. Um, so I don't know if people want to pre-sell. Mustard farmers are generally a pretty um, patient slash stubborn lot. So it, it's, um, you know, whether that we're, they, may, they may just, you know, say forget about pre-selling, but uh, yeah. Gonna, yeah, whatever. We'll just wait it out. Um, so anyway, so those are... I don't know if there if there were some questions about certain crops in particular that you had that, but that's kind of a bit of a roundup on on them anyway. Yeah, I think the like the green the green crops, right? Like he's mentioned earlier, peas and lentils. You got to stay on top of those for sure. Um, and you got some great opportunities to price, like exactly, you know, exactly. mid fifties on on uh, small and large green lentils. It's kind of I keep looking at the numbers and going back to your canola uh, acres potentially being down a little bit. Like I have canola in my calculations. It, it's not that shiny. It comes in, it's on the, the positive side of, of middle, but, but not, but not by much. Like it's yeah. uh, especially with the market sliding here. Um, yeah. And in most recently. years it's top two or three. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. Well, Chuck, I appreciate your perspective. The listeners appreciate your perspective. I had a few guys asking, when's Chuck coming back on? <laughs> and uh, so glad we could get this on the calendar and uh, and get this uh, recorded. So thank you so much, Chuck. I so appreciate do you want to do insights. the next one from Cayman Islands? Is that because I'll be there. I will. Uh, I will try to meet you there. I will see. I'll juggle some things around here and uh, okay. see what well, I can do. Well, if I have a beach background, you'll know. You'll know. What's going on there. <laughs> We're definitely recording. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Take you care. Bet. Bye. Well, now we know where Chuck has his bank accounts. I think he said Cayman Islands in that uh, segment. So now we know he's going to do his banking. Uh, anyways, uh, it's always great to have Chuck Penner on the show. A uh, wealth of information. And I know uh, I get a lot of feedback from listeners uh, saying, when's Chuck going to be on next? Or uh, always positive comments around that. So thanks, Chuck, uh, for joining us. Um, end of the uh, episode here, folks. Uh, what, 
uh, last thing I need to do here is just announce our winner uh, for the month of January for the What the Futures uh, Pioneer Seeds uh, Canola um, Contest. So again, if you texted in the word Nashville uh, to uh, 1-855-606-1889, you got entered twice. You got entered to win, potentially win a bag of canola seed. You got entered as well uh, to potentially win a trip for two uh, to Nashville, Tennessee. We draw for that later in March. There'll be much more details around it. Wanted uh, listeners to get that early uh, entry, though. Uh, so there's there'll be multiple ways to participate. So without further further ado, uh, I just want to congratulate uh, Chris from Shandro Acres. Uh, he won uh, our bag of P516L from the folks over at Pioneer Seeds. Of course, that is Tower Farms is the agency. Jacob and Becky Boychuk, uh, they've been supporting the podcast since day one. And uh, that's now three winners of canola seed that we've had uh, from the show. We had Matt uh, at the launch party in November. Uh, we had Brad who won in December. And now we have Chris our winner here in January uh, from from Andrew, Alberta. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Uh, we will uh, get back to uh, figuring out our next contest, and we'll get something launched for uh, uh, for next week here and for the next month. So stay tuned for that. Of course, uh, if you want to communicate with me, uh, you can text me at the number I've already mentioned. You can hit us up on X, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We're across those platforms. Uh, our website is whatthefuturespodcast.ca. Uh, if you want to partner, if you want me to come out uh, to an event, if you want me to, uh, uh, if you if your company is interested in in uh, potentially participating in, in the podcast here in some way or fashion, uh, reach out. Go to the website. Send me a note. And I'm certainly happy to have conversations. So thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in once again. Episode 13 in the can. I'm out.